Welcome, um, Seminary JSR. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, for those who uh, are new, this is a one of our Clear Mountain interviews, and we're really lucky today to have uh, Seminary Jayasara joining us from Australia. Um, and as a brief introduction, Seminary Jayasara has studied and practiced Buddhism and meditation in various capacities for over 35 years. She has a PhD and master's degree in education, focusing on comparative spiritual traditions, Buddhism, and psychotherapy. She has taught at secondary, undergraduate, and postgraduate levels in psychology and counseling, and also worked as a trainer in mental health and crisis intervention in the welfare sector. Jayasara initially ordained as an Anigarika, eight precept nun, in the Theravada forest tradition in 2002, living at both Damasara Monastery in Western Australia and Amaravati and Chittaviveka Monasteries in the UK for two years. She, has re she re entered the monastic life as a seminary, 10 precept nun in 2018 at Santi Forest Monastery, where she helped to maintain and further develop Santi as a monastery for female monastics. In 2021, Jayasara moved to Viveka Hermitage in Southern New South Wales to allow more focus on a growing online Dhamma project she had initiated, as well as to cultivate a more hermetic style of practice. And she currently lives at Viveka Hermitage with Ayachit Indriya and Sumudu Mahateri, AKA Pat. Seminary Jaisara, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> You're welcome, Venerable. It's lovely to be here. Yep, Finally. So <laughs> <laughs> we had some technical issues. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't mentioned in uh, the biography, which um, you know, usually kind of personal traits aren't so mentioned in, in such, um, such writings. But um, having listened to a couple of interviews with you, um, we had, as we had tried a recording before, and I had mentioned that you've got an amazing YouTube presence. You've got a, a channel called the Wisdom of the Masters, which is you reading uh, all sorts of uh, readings from contemplative texts, contemplative traditions. And it's really quite wonderful. You've gotten a, an amazing voice, uh, but there are also interviews with you. And something which I had picked up on from some of those interviews was just a, perhaps at least when you were younger, like a personal uh, inclination towards rebelliousness. And um, it sounded like that manifested when you were in a, a Christian school growing up and then in Goenka retreats later on, these meditation retreats. Um, and I'm curious if how, if you could speak a little bit more about that tendency and if you feel it has any kind of spiritual value or monastic usefulness. Yeah, well, it, it has seemed to continue in the even in, within the Buddhist tradition, too, given given, given what I'm doing. Um, but a couple of things about it. I mean, as you as you noted, it is a personality tray, and so it's something I have to work with, be conscious of, deal with. And uh, I was born in 1966, which is the year of the fire horse. And if you know anything about Chinese um, astrology, the fire horse year, particularly for women, is considered to be a year of great, they're supposed to be great rebels. And in uh, parts of rural China, you know, some fairly uh, primitive places in China, when if girls were born in the year of the, the fire horse, probably in my year, 1966, it was kapat for them because they were said to bring great um, change and upheaval and rebelliousness to their family, so which probably meant they didn't get married and didn't do what they were told. So it has, um, I don't know even how I know that. I think you just, as you go through year, the years, you read about your birth year. And that was certainly evident in my year of schooling. It was a year of a lot of rebels. So I wasn't the only one, but, um, you, you know, in terms of Dharma, it's, it is a personality trait which has both its um, benefits and drawbacks and I've had to, to learn to live with it and ultimately, you know, the practice is to uproot this personality view and, and so I try not to take it seriously but I also try to be conscious of it and, and work with it more skillfully than perhaps when I was a, a young'un and use that energy of 
you know, because if you think of it as, as the wild horse, the fire horse with lots of energy, it wants to go outside. The, it can't be contained within a narrow um, field. It needs to explore. So I guess the, the, the benefits of having that fire horse energy is that, and it's manifesting in the way that I'm, I'm living and practicing, is that the mind, the personality wants to go outside and explore and needs that freedom to, to, to learn from all different traditions and teachings and to embrace that. And it's very hard for a fire horse female to be contained within an institution or a marriage or a relationship or a job because that, that's the energy, you know, think of those horses. And so when the wind's blowing, fire horses love to be out running wild. So... Seminary so, Jaisar, sorry, the, um, I like the analogy and the image, and I'm curious, um, you've said in another interview that you've kind of had to move away from being a Theravada fundamentalist and perhaps <laughs> energy, but at the same time, you do have a very clear and strong form, and you obviously seem to have found an anchor or some home pasture in the Theravada. So... I'm really curious what you see as this, um, how you play with that dynamic. I know when the Dalai Lama was talking mm. about what the best religion was, he said, yours. And I think the Buddhist, Buddhism is the most comprehensive. So how do you balance these different articulations that you uh, move through? And why do you keep coming back into the robes that we see you in now? <laughs> Uh, I have no idea. I mean, really, I don't have any idea how I got here and what I'm doing here. Uh, but there's, you know, I see the benefit of Theravadan. Uh, well, you know, it's it's what I first was introduced to. And it spoke to me because of its no nonsense, its clarity, its logic, its rationality, you know, um, and its depth, too. And so it, it also, you know, having gone into the monastery, and the first round, as you mentioned, and started practicing within the Theravadan and the Pashna traditions, I saw the benefits that that um, need for restraint offered me, you know, because if I, it's that balance, isn't it, between repression and constraint and free-flowingness. And that's, I guess, what I've tried to learn and are still learning to practice restraint but also not to become uptight and tense and fundamentalist because I've, I've, I've been on both extremes and I think we, we have to have a taste of both extremes sometimes to realise how do you find the middle, middle way dharma. So, and so I really appreciate what um, Buddhist monasticism offers me as a way of living and, and um, keeping sila and, and the, the precepts and being having that model of the Eightfold Noble Path because, you know, there's a lot of the other traditions which I really love and respect, but they don't offer you such a clear boundary. And I guess I do need that boundary as a fire horse and I also need freedom. So it's, it's always been this kind of... Um, balancing act to find it and you know and who knows where where we've come from in the past to to have this resonance with this particular tradition uh, obviously there's some past life resonance for me but I have so many resonance with other traditions as well so I've been doing this for eons <laughs> in different colored robes and uh, I'll get there eventually <laughs> even though there's nowhere to get. So it's all, it's all just a bit of an interesting dream that we're in, trying to wake up from. And here we are in, in robes in this lifetime, trying to make sense of it all. And to be, and to be kind of honour the Buddha's teachings and what that really means in our own hearts ra rather than just what it means within the tradition or in the scriptures. You know? And that's, I guess that's my path, wanting to just, find the authentic dharma as much as I can. And for that, that's why the fire horse needs a little bit of freedom to move, you know. I'm curious if you've, uh, you mentioned like the, the value of restraint that you found in the Goenka tradition, whether that's restraint of the senses, which is almost just compulsory if you're attending a <laughs> but, you know, 
any yeah. kind of have to really pull in, but also, you know, becoming a monastic. We have, we've got so many rules and kind of, hit, you know, someone could see it as being hemmed in on all sides. So you mentioned the value of restraint, but I'm curious about if you could speak a little, a little bit more, if um, some of these Theravada teachings, although there is so much talk about, um, yeah, pulling in, if, if you have um, gotten anything from, yeah, the Goenka tradition or your teaching or your studies in the Thai forest tradition about an expansive, having an expansive mind and an expansive approach, because it seems like both of those exist within a, a Theravada worldview. I'm not sure I understand your question. So you're saying, you're talking about the restraints within the Theravada and the, the expansive view, so what, what? Right, well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, it's very easy to see like the restraints and all yeah. the um, uh, very ex, uh, explicit teachings, the gradual path of the Theravada view. But then you've also got teachings which are a lot more expansive, like in yeah, your yeah. of the teachers, you've got teaching from Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Lee. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I guess it depends on where you are and where the teachers and who the teachers are talking to, because, you know, you would have read yourself Ajahn Chah sometimes talking to, to the monks, particularly the Thai monks, and he's really, wow, you know, do this, do that, be straight down the line. And then for other people who are too tight, I think probably Westerners, you'd say just relax, open up, you know, don't be so uptight about if you make a mistake with keeping your, 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 your vows and so on. So um, I think you can find it all within the really, you know, the enlightened teachers within the Ajahn Chah or the, um, the Thai forest tradition that, they see the value in, in the early stages of the practice of just having that restraint because the mind's just all over the place and the ego is constantly making excuses about what it should be able to do or what's right and what's wrong. And we need to come up against that. But ultimately when the mind is free, the mind's free. So there's those sorts of um, you know, rules and, and restrictions don't apply anymore but within any of these traditions like in in the Zogchen or the non-dual teachings you'll get people saying well you know it's there is no karma there is no there is no self there is no this there, therefore it means I can do anything and they think they're already arrived there but it's that's just delusion and when someone's really arrived there they don't go around talking like that but their their, their life and their work is spontaneous and free so it's always, I think, about just being honest about where you're, where you're at. And even if you are keeping rules or wearing the robes, it's always got to be done with wisdom, that these are just conventional practices. They're not the ultimate truth. Um, and if we're holding them too tight, then the life or the practice becomes very unpleasant. But if we're holding them with, with wisdom and, and understanding, then we carry them lightly and we see it as the, as the raft, you know, and then eventually the raft we let go of, don't we? So this is what I think I was saying before in the first or the second installment, I can't remember, but it's, that's my practice is to always try and just find that balancing, you know, where I'm too tight, where I'm too loose and just to, to stay authentic and, and on the middle path with all of this. Jaya Sara, when you speak about the um, balance between tension or restraint and uh, freedom, um, I feel like that what is already a difficult balance for monastics to strike, speaking from my own experience, when it comes to female monastics is even, you know, there's an added layer of difficulty in navigating, uh, you know, a, a dearth of places to pursue ordination and um, other confounding factors and difficult factors. What would you say um, to a woman hoping to ordain? What would your advice be um, struggling to kind of find a way towards that and having difficulty finding the right situation, um, et cetera, but with that deep inner heart 
um, what advice do you would you give her or what advice would you give yourself as a young a young nun? Oh, I, I really wouldn't give any advice. <laughs> really, I just think, you know, if when we really reflect on it, we just have to be, be true to ourselves and allow things to unfold and we can have these aspirations and ideals about monasticism and then it all comes crumbling down. That's not a bad thing, actually. But, you know, everyone's got such different karma, such different proclivities. For me, it's been a very unique, interesting journey, um, you know, not like anybody else's, but neither could it ever be. But, um, yeah, I'm not a bhikkhuni too. I'm, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm trying my best to do the 10 precepts, venerable. <laughs> You know, I just, I, I, I don't think I'd make it as a bikini and I just have to be honest about that because I, I just, yeah, just, I couldn't, couldn't put this wild horse within those certain constraints and I admire people who can do that and hold it with ease. Um, but all those rules, what, 300 and something, I can't remember. So I've just had to be honest that this is where, what works for me. These this suits my my temperament, my my strengths and my weaknesses, and it's working so far. And um, working, what does that mean? I don't know. I just I just feel like it's um, I'm able to live authentically and still be um, honor the Buddha's teachings and, and live in this way is, is suits me. So if some women, young women, have got aspirations to be do to be bhikkhunis, good for them. And I, of course, support that. And they should te talk to the other bhikkhunis, not me. Mm. <laughs> I just encourage everyone to just be true to themselves, whatever that means, you know, and they can only judge. We can only judge for ourselves. Samanir, it's really great to learn about different ways of living a yeah. really sincere uh a deeply sincere Buddhist life or uh, spiritual contemplative life. And I think some is one which um, most people probably don't know about, like what it's like to, to live in that. Well, could you say a bit more about just what the container of being a seminary entails and what your, what your life looks like uh, keeping those. Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty normal and natural. That's why I think it suits me because I I'm Australian and I can't, kind of do the Thai thing, you know, and I can't do the religious thing. And I'm, I'm not particularly, um, you know, uh, pious. So this is as close as I can get to kind of living a religious life and still feel authentic. And um, so, yeah, I just live, a, we both just live a very simple life here. And we, we keep, I guess, the routine, um, like you would in a monastery, but we we don't have a lot of guests and dana. But as seminaries, we can still cook, you know, and shop for ourselves. Mostly we do that shopping online, so we don't have to go out much. And we just you know, practice, a court, you know, within our own spaces. I, Jatinda and I have separate living quarters, so you know, we, we practice according to... Um, I was going to say our own design, <laughs> just what works for us and walk and do yoga. And I obviously do my readings and contemplations on, on YouTube and, and whatnot. And we're supported through don the kind donations of, of um, supporters to, to be able to do this. So it's very simple and very natural. And our, we have neighbours and they just relate to us as normal people. And they know we're nuns and they respect that. So it's, it's, it's nothing special, but it's, you know, it is special at the same time. We feel very fortunate to be able to live like this, but we, we're not, we don't stand out too much. You know, we're not freaks. <laughs> we're not trying to be noticed, trying to keep a low profile. So, yeah, and it, so it's working quite well. I mean, it seems like one significant aspect that I've picked up on just from uh, some of your your talks is that uh, you're very emphatic that the teachings that you give are offered offered freely. So you're not so it's your your role, your container, your 
the archetype of a samaneri, it's, it's, it is one which it's not like a, a lay Dhamma teacher. You're very much, you're, it's a different, different model. Mm, yeah. And we've set up a Vaker hermitage and we have um, stu a steward to kind of manage things and we don't touch money, cash, you know, they just come in forms of gift cards or donations, just like we did at Santi Monastery, only that now we've got a little Viveka Hermitage. So that's how we, we managed to do it. And we just try and do that as with as much clear intention as possible. And the other thing I'm very fortunate to be able to do with this is to support other monastics um, within other traditions. So we share our donations when and where we can with other Sangha members and other Sangha institutions. And that's been really, really lovely to be able to do that. So that's great. That's beautiful to hear, Seminary Jaisar, and I didn't know that. Um, mm. and, well, we and try I, not to advertise it, but then I just said it, so. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, we can have Mudita and uh, appreciate it. One thing I am curious is you speak about this is the form that allows you to feel authentic. Yeah. And, uh, there's a phrase of, and I think it applies to many people in our community and those I know who encounter the Dhamma and find their lives aren't, fe don't feel in line. And they sort of have one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel. And mm -hmm. their, their karmic conditions feel such that they, I think, don't feel like they're living their authentic life. And yet they don't see a route to that. Um, they can't ordain, they can't step away from the karmic duties they have um how would what advice or what i maybe you wouldn't give advice, yeah, not an advice what, what <laughs> might come up for someone in that situation uh what what are your thoughts what might come up sorry i'm that bit cut off all right what reflections would you have for someone in that oh, situation yeah. yeah i think again we just can't force these things can we we just everybody's going to come up against different things. Although at, at one level, you know, we all come up against the classic thing of, uh, I, I suppose, of ideals and then realising that Buddhist monasticism or Buddhism itself isn't an ideal, it's a lived experience. So when, you come, when one comes up against that frustration or that doubt or that confusion about which direction to go, I mean, Ajahn Chah would say, there's your Dharma, there's your teaching, work with that. Um, it's it's always the mind wanting or not wanting. It's always the push pull, the struggle, that I want to be this perfect monk or nun, or I want to live this perfect life. And it's like I don't want to go back to my family, or should I? Shouldn't I? And it's just the mind doing its thing, and that's where we that's where we learn. That's where we come really into the authentic dharma of of looking at the mind and beginning to understand this mind that's always about me and mine and my problems and my desires and my aspirations. It's just the same old, same old and just letting go of that. And then when we let go, you know, we know life has a way of kind of becoming clear when we get out of the way and the path becomes clear and things fall into place or they push us somewhere else. So that's why with my journey, it's always been, I don't know, I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I here I am, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I I feel comfortable living as a seminary now. We've, I think we're up to our sixth Vasa this year. Yeah, I, I don't know. You say, are you doing it for life? Some people say, yeah, you may, yeah, I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen? So, um, Feels, feels, it feels right now, and um, I just keep watching the mind, see what comes up. Yeah. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, on this this point of of watching the mind, I'm curious um, about so many of the the teachings, you, the the readings that you choose um, for wisdom of the masters. A lot of them are, you know, non dual uh, teachings on non dual, whether it's from Advaita or uh, from Tibetan traditions, or even, you know, some hints in that direction uh, from Theravada sources. Oh, uh, yeah, there's heaps of non-dual stuff in Theravada, if you look. Yeah, and I'm curious about how you've come to that. Like, did you, I mean, it sounded like your first Buddhist influences were Goenka, which is usually, 
you know, spoken of in a non-dual or in, in a kind of dualistic. Dualistic, yeah, yeah. But I'm curious, yeah, how did you, how have you, historically, how has it come about uh, just your own biography that you've come to love these non-dual teachings? And then how have you integrated the, integrated all them? Because I'm not sure how frequently your podcasts or YouTube videos come out, but it's, it's really, at least for someone watching from the outside, you know, you might have, you know, non-dual Sufi teaching one week, and then it's, you know, uh, Thai forest tradition the next, and then it's the Pali Canon, and then it's uh, Nisargadatta. And um, yeah, you, you kind of seamlessly seem to, or at least how we're receiving it, kind of blend these non-dual with seeming dual, and it kind of goes back and forth. So curious um, how you, you do this or hold this for yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I don't really believe in the duality of non-dual and dual, dualistic either. That in itself is a duality. Even when something appears to be dualistic, if you really look and listen, a lot of these masters are pointing beyond that. So I, I kind of reject, you know, I'm not really buying into that. And um, there are a number of teachings which are on my channel which would appear to be dualistic, you know, particularly from the, the suttas, but it, they're so profound and they're pointing the way to recognising that which goes beyond the conditioned mind, but it's not rejecting. This is what I was saying before. We, we think we're already there in the non-dual state, therefore we don't have to worry about precepts or um, the, the, these notions of cause and effect, but most people aren't beyond that, even if they just want to subscribe to the non-dual view and that the there's, there's a good reason the Buddha taught the way he did for um, for, for being very conscious of morality and, and sila and karma um, as a way of transcending it but also realizing it's all part of the whole anyway so this 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 dualistic view is part of the non-dualistic framework anyway if that makes sense actually, but, um, oh. go on sorry actually yeah just a clarifying question what is the non-dualistic framework what is non-dual well I guess it's, 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 to, to put it simply it's it's recognizing that there is no separation between things there a non-dual view would say that things are there, there appears to be cause and effect but you know everything's just part of the one whole and that's ultimately true but we do have individual bodies and we do have individual karma which is contained within the whole non-dual fabric of the universe if you like um, and until we've really transcended that and um, have no more identification with it we're still dualistic be we're still individual beings you know, so we have to always come back to that. We can aspire to be free from that intellectually, but and, until that really happens. So I'm not trying to just promote a, a non-dual teaching, but I guess the idea is if we realise the non-separateness of ourselves, then our behaviours will be in alignment with that because, you know, if the ego dissipates more and more, then we, we stop acting out of ego clinging, ego identification. And so our, our behaviours will naturally be in alignment with, with what, you know, right view and, and right action, speech and so on. Um, but there was something else you said about the, the, the YouTube setup too. Um, yeah, I think... It, you can you can just find even within what appears to be a, a dualistic setup like Theravada, so much of the non-dual teachers like Ajahn Sumedho, my teacher. If you listen to him, he just speaks so much like many of the Dzogchen masters now, and he never used to. And he even says that you know I used to say well make a hard effort and do, and he's just so free flowing now, and and he's speaking in that kind of I guess higher mode ultimate mode but he he's been through the struggle of effort and you know attainment and 
and is just trying to help everyone relax now. And just one last thing on that, because I didn't, I didn't start out with Vipassana really. I started out with Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti. So he's really the quintessential rebel, if you like. Um, you could call him non-dual too if you want to. But he, 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 he kind of didn't want labels either. He wanted us to go beyond these words, these definitions. And so he, he's probably the one that where I was most steeped for many years in terms of my contemplations. Yeah, that's interesting. I was also really somewhat influenced by him as well. I mean, his book, yeah. Only Revolution. I just yeah, thought that- beautiful. Was, yeah, just great yeah. and really yeah. true. Uh, yeah. I'm curious, you know, there are these uh, teachings, so much of my understanding of non-dual teachings are really about a shift of mind in the present moment. And, you know, in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta and elsewhere, there is this refrain about being mindful and alert when going forward, coming back, stretching, um, you know, walking, sitting, standing, lying down, and then also speaking, listening, remaining quiet, et cetera. One remains mindful and clearly knowing, mindful and alert. And something which you do really beautifully, which anyone who goes to your, your YouTube channel can listen to, is a practice of speaking the Dhamma speaking the Dhamma. And I'm curious if you could say more about that. I think it's something which is, I don't know if I've ever heard uh, a teacher talk about the nuances of actually shifting the mind, practicing the Dhamma through speaking the Dhamma, like using just vocalizing as a, a means to um, attune to this other, the shift of uh, of perception and not self-perception, a non-dual perception, and it, is that does that occur for you? Is is your 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 channel, your reading practice, your speaking practice, is it a vehicle? Is it almost a meditation for you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and you know, it's just getting out of the way as simple as simple as possible. Is and when we, you know, within this tradition, as you know, Ajahn Chah always encouraged people to speak from the heart. And, and when Arjun Sumedho did all these notes for his first talk and had all his, all his structure laid out, Arjun Chah said, no, don't ever do that again. So it's about going free fall when, we, when, we engage, when we're really in tune with the Dharma, it's not coming out of a preconceived notion of this is how it's going to be, this is what I'm going to say, this is how it's going to sound. This is how I'm going to be received. So, and that can be scary because we're trained to plan and prepare and to polish all this stuff, make sure we put on our best voice presentation. So, uh, you know, apart from clearing up a few mispronunciations, if they happen, it just I just open up, tune in, let go and, and read and, it, you know, somehow it works. Um, so it just, it's allowing, trying, well, they're not even trying. It's just knowing that the, the Dharma just does come through us all if we find that space of quiet, quiet awareness within. And just notice what comes up in the mind, the judgments, the, the doubts or whatever might pop up and just keep flowing let those things go and um, it doesn't really matter what comes out <laughs> and, and, and but trusting too that what comes out will be okay and if, if people think it's not okay they've all got their own judgments about it that's fine that's fine you know take some feedback if it's constructive and I don't know why I'm thinking about Ajahn Chah so much, probably because I'm looking at you two venerables. But he said that, um, you know, he said he was like a big tree and some people, some the birds come and take the fruits and say, oh, that's sweet. And others say, that's sour, and spit it out. And he said that he's just like a big tree and, and doesn't, it's, it's just all the opinions of, and views of people taking it or not taking it and just standing like a big tree and it doesn't matter just that's where the dharma is isn't it just 
and our true home then. I'd love to drill in just a little bit on this, um, you know, your maybe even the specifics of the conditions of that you set up for, for your readings, um, for the Wisdom of the Masters series. Because I mean, conditions are helpful. They can support actually participating in a non-dual awareness. Yeah. And um, yeah, I imagine, I think you've got over 300 videos, maybe a lot more than that. Um, but yeah, what, what are some of these specifics? So if anyone wanted to, I mean, not necessarily have a YouTube channel, but even just perhaps reading aloud to themselves, is that something you do? Or if you're preparing to um, actually record a YouTube session, what conditions do you set up? What is, uh, what is the arrangement for that? And what do you, do you try to, uh, how do you set your mind, mind in a place to do that as well? Simple, just empty, plug in the mic, bring up the teaching that has somehow presented itself to me and just read it. And look, it's really, what's really interesting is that I think you can kind of tell if it's an authentic, true master speaking. It kind of starts speaking to you, through you, at you. And uh, it, it wakes you up. And this, and this is interesting. Are you still getting me? Because I've got an oops sign popped up. Yeah, we're still good. Okay. And yet somehow... If it's if it's genuine dharma, deep dharma, it's still coming through despite years passing and many different translators, and it it does it itself. I you know I I wouldn't even be able to tell you what I do. It, it is it just happens, you know. And I think maybe it happens because I, uh, well, I just have a love for the dharma, you know, like we all do, and. And do it when the when the world is a bit quiet because we get a bit of noise happening sometimes around here. That doesn't help. There's chainsaws going. Um, so just when the world's quiet, put the mic in. I find that reading that uh, has spoken to me, and I just read it. It's as, as simple as that. And just try to be present. Just like when you're meditating, you just. Be present with it. So it's nothing, nothing special, but it it um, seems to work. But and it doesn't for everyone. Some of the birds say it's sour. <laughs> you YouTube is full of such birds. I don't think that's on on you. Somewhere. What's that? What's that? <laughs> YouTube is full of I such know, birds. I know. I know. Yeah, they're there to they're there to teach us too, aren't they? I just I just don't I just ignore it or you know, if they're being disparaging towards any of the teachings, I just block them. You know, particularly if they're saying something very unskillful and unhelpful from themselves about any of the masters or about any of the spiritual traditions. I won't stand for that. <laughs> it doesn't help them, you know, and it just caught yeah. this is so harmful to be saying that and then trying to trigger other people. So it's best that they just remain quiet. Seminary Jai, sorry, if, um, I can ask about, you speak about this love of the Dhamma and, you know, it strikes me that when you also speak about non-dualism, um, so many of the articulations and language, it's like trying to put a box around space yeah, and yeah, it's not. people come up with quite, quite elaborate boxes and become fixated oh, on the great, boxes. That's great, that's great, yeah. But, but I mean, some of the bombs are so useful. And one of them is the word God and beloved. And, so, you know, Ajahn Suchat said that for Thais who grew up with Buddhism, the word Buddha invokes in them the same mm. thing, the word God. Mm. Invokes mm. And um, or someone who grew up in a Judeo-Christian tradition. And and yet, uh, and Aj Ajahn Panyavada said that if you investigated God to the very end, you would achieve awakening. And I'm curious, there's problems and baggage with that term as well, but it, it certainly is powerful for mm. me. What's your relationship to the word God? I don't have a problem with God anymore. <laughs> I was brought up a Catholic girl. 
and um, you know, with all the baggage around that I imaging around God. But um, as you know, I read a lot of the Christian mystics too, and I just when I read that, I really feel their deep love and faith and trust in the beloved. And I just find that really inspiring. And it's so it takes me into the same space that this God that everybody has a problem with or is arguing about is simply our own impersonal reality and the space that we come to, you know, within Buddhist meditation when we're deeply at rest and deeply within that non-dual reality and and coupled with all the wisdom and in, insight that that has. And then the mind has to just be quiet. It can't say anything anymore. So that's that's where God can take people. Um, and it's, it's, it's transcending all these limited notions of, of, of self and other and world and and everything in the world and all the phenomena and i really liked your mention of tying tying what was it boxes and what did you say putting in elaborate boxes yeah long chamber has a saying that people tie them get themselves tied up in knots or trying to try tie space into knots yeah and that's you know all the all the views and opinions and ah you know the postulations, as the Buddha would say, or the um, speculative views about things, God or the world or eternalism, blah blah blah. So I'm not a I'm not a big philosopher or speaker. I just I just like to read the Dharma. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> that is well said, and. Um... I'm curious in terms of the coming back to that home pasture of, of the Theravada and Pali Canon, has there been one teaching or phrase or sutta from, from the suttas that has come back to you and echoed through your, your spiritual path or comes back to you often in your day-to-day -day life, even a, a small one? Yeah, many at different times, but lately I guess um, I particularly do like the uh, Wachagota Sutta where he just, he's not going to get into it. I, you know, watcher, I do not hold this view. Watcher, I do not hold this view. It's great. Oh, what about this one? No, I don't hold that. And then he says, clearly, it's it's a feta. It's a, um, it's a wilderness, a thicket of views and, and just blah, blah, blah. And that's just what's happening out there. It's been happening since the Buddha's time. Everyone just speculating about or talking about reality and trying to kind of be really clear about what consciousness is or awareness is, what dualism is, what non-dualism is, and blah, blah, blah. And the Buddha just cuts it through and comes back to, you know, that brilliant teaching. And I often listen and reflect on that and, then, and that it doesn't lead, it's just a fever, it doesn't lead to dispassion, to nibbana, to enlightenment and it just brings it back home. Uh, it's just one of yeah, it's one of my favourite suttas, I'd say. And um, I, I I don't know. I just really like his obstinance. <laughs> I do not hold such a view. And the way I've read that actually from my channel, so I think I'm projecting a little bit onto the Buddha. But he's going, I do, Bacha, I do not hold this view. I'm really sick of this. <laughs> I'm over it, Bacha. I do not hold such a view. He's going, what about this? And you can imagine all these Indians with, and who are very intellectual and they like to debating and very philosophical and oh, la, 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 la. and he's like, I'm not. <laughs> so I encourage people to go to, to read that one or listen to that one. It's a beautiful sutta. Yeah, it is a beautiful Isn't sutta. It? I think there are even some areas where they recite that on a regular basis. Um, oh, yeah. But I'm, I'm curious about where you find your inspiration for for reading do you just have a huge library and you just you know point to somewhere god. on the on the wall and yeah god <laughs> yeah. it's just it, well let's uh, a couple of things if we come back to the kind of the, the relative world Pe people request 
numerous things and some I'll look into and some I'll resonate with and some I won't. And then things appear magic, as if by magic. Like, for example, I realise I haven't done many uh, Advaita readings of late. I've done a few Nizagadatas, but I've earlier on when I was, I guess, exploring this, and it was a personal exploration. It wasn't just to think. I didn't want to just... Um, populate my channel. But I was really interested to read the Viveka Chudamani. If you if you listen, perhaps you don't want to read, listen to me reading it, it's such an old recording. But um, if you read aspects of it, it's so Buddhist. And I was really amazed by just how clear it was. And same with the Advadhut Gita and and some and obviously the Upanishads. So I really I loved exploring and finding those parallels in in those um, ancient Vedantic texts. And then I realised the other day, oh, boy, I haven't done any for a while and I'm not sure where to go. And then someone just happened to send me two fantastic translations of a Kashmir Shaivism um, text, which I couldn't pronounce now. And then I said, oh, that's lovely. And then he sent me another one that he's translated and given me carte blanche to, to read it. So as I, how did that happen? Just I just had it in my mind and then some kind person from your country who's a translator, I can't remember his name, sent them to me and they're perfect. They'll be beautiful, Vedantic, non-jeweled teachings to read. So it, I don't know, it just happens, it just happens. I um, Going back to kind of one conventional question and one beyond conventional <laughs> question, not that there's no duality between yes. the two. Um, if, uh, what have you found, I'm just curious about this, um, have you found there's anything unique that really makes um, female monastic communities function function better? Or uh, sorry, like what qualities would you emphasize in a female monastic community that would lead to, to harmony in that situation particularly? I think just listening. And empathy, perhaps the two, you know, we can, as females, we can go overboard with that and get too too involved in each other's emotional life. But there, um, there is a capacity, natural capacity, whether it's conditioned or in, in, ingrained, who knows, a bit of both. The, the women do have a natural empathy and ability to really feel and listen to where the other person's at. And um, not always. I mean, geez, sometimes I've felt really cut off. But when we're working well as women and really in tune with our womanness, um, I think that's a really strong quality and a certain ability to be fearless too. So, but I, you know, I'm, again, I'm not the person to come to for advice on how to run women's monasteries. I was I was a big rebel at Dharmasara. I was one of the first Anagarikas there, and um, but you know that's okay too. It's what what we need to burn up and work through. And uh, you know, I I burnt up a lot of stuff working through that difficult time at Dharmasara with her. And um, yeah, just let go of any any resentments, any any pains that. They've all been through it too. That's the other thing. All these great Ajans who we might bow down to and think, oh, they're so holy. Ajahn Sumedho is so open about the struggles he's had in his, what, 50 years as a monk, leading communities, the personality stuff he had to come up against, the doubts, the disappointments. And I just really, that's why I love him and respect him so much. He's so honest about that and always applying Ajahn Chah's wisdom to those struggles, um, that's how you burn it up, let go, you know, come out the other side, free from it all. So, so Mary Jess, are we so appreciate this time and um, we are aware that we've kept you for quite a while, but uh, just one final question and then Ajahn Kovila will yeah, close if sure. that's all right. Um, you speak about your first moment of being aware of yourself as a separate person, as uh, being uh, a child, maybe between eight and 18 months. Um, 
and hearing the hooves of Clydesdale horses, I think, out in front of your house on the paving stones or the pavement and just realizing you were a separate person and hmm. being a bit dismayed by that fact. <laughs> now, when you hear the hooves outside, um, metaphorically or otherwise, what, what do you think? What comes into your mind then? Well, I think there's less identification with this separate form and less fear as a result of that lessening identification. And it's funny to think that, I mean, I, th I think I said on that Sam Harris interview that I thought I was about eight months, but you know, I think I was even younger because I was what's called in a Moses basket. And a Moses basket, mother, or my mother, put us in when we were really young and they'd keep, you know, she'd keep the, the really young babies in the, the parents' room the first few months. So I must have been even younger than 18 months, maybe four or five months. Not that it matters too much, but it, just to say that isn't it amazing that it, even as a, a baby, there's still that sense, that I notion of separateness is there, is the root of conceit. And that it, it wasn't in its full-blown form yet. It would obviously come and go. But when it did come to the fore and a sense of fear developed around it, it meant that that, that sense of separateness was there um, as a seed about to germinate in this baby and go through its rebellious years as a child, as a me, me, me. But I guess now, I, um, you know, it depends on what state the mind's in, but being able to integrate that sense of separateness within a non-dual world is, is much easier. There's less fear. Uh, not always. Certain things can trigger it, but that's, that's where the work starts. But, you know, and that's why the path has been one of deepening wisdom and understanding about what this whole whole trip's about, what this, this whole body-mind experience and formation is about and learning that, ah, oh, okay, this, this fear arises when there's a sense of me, of separateness and identification and grasping, even within a three-month-year-old baby. Amazing, I think. It was there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Samir. That's all right. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll link to the Viveka Hermitage website okay. in the uh, YouTube. Yep. And um, yeah, it's just wonderful to meet you virtually. And we definitely look forward to meeting you someday, hopefully in person. And yeah, do you have any parting thoughts? Uh, no, just I think for if anyone's listening to this, just to say, keep going it's all we can do you know it's a, and and not not get so tied up about thinking we've got to get it all right and perfect and learning that when things that don't go okay for us in our monastic life or in our lay life it's all it's all good you know it's all valuable lessons thank you and um i just want to say your um gentleness and trust uh, are kind of a balm. Oh, that's and nice. <laughs> it's here, and I, I really appreciate that. And just to say, yeah, thank you for your wisdom and offerings. And please, if you uh, or I, Chitindria, come, or the cat, uh, find yourself on the west coast of the US, we, we really hope you'd come by. I'm sure so. we would. If we're gonna make that effort to go all that way, we'd definitely <laughs> pop into Clima Seattle, is it? Yeah, I've been there yes, once before yes. when I, Jatindra, was teaching a retreat at Cloud Mountain, Cloud Mountain with um, Tanya, former Ajahn Willa. Uh, no, Ajahn Tanya, who's now Willa. I'll get that back to front. So it was interesting to go to the States for a, for a short visit. Yeah. Maybe again. Who knows? Who knows? The world's in such a state now, isn't it? Especially your country. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, uh, yes, um, but we are near Cloud Mountain. Ah, so are you? We'd, oh, uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. We didn't realize that we picked our name 
it's very similar. Clear mountain, cloud mountain, beautiful mountain. Yeah, beautiful mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Venerables. Uh, it's, uh, it's lovely to connect with you both too. And um, I'm glad that you found my offerings helpful and yeah, we'll, um, we'll stay in touch. Thank you.